Welcome to this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm TK Kerstetter, and I'll be your host for today's show. Today, we're going to talk about how should boards oversee the most challenging GRC issues today. And joining me is a friend and an expert. Let me introduce Michael Montalongo, who's a board member with Conduent Inc. and Civio Corporation, and is also the CEO of GRC Advisory Services. Welcome back, Michael. Great to be back, TK. Thanks so very much. I appreciate the invitation. We both know this is an area that is, you know, really going wild, you might say. And so can you give our audience some examples of current board GRC oversight issues? And I also am curious if there's a common thread that sort of runs through these issues. You bet. And look, thank you for spotlighting this very timely topic, because as I'm sure that your audience, our audience, I guess I should say, will attest to uh, the boardroom inboxes are not just full, they're overflowing with these issues, frankly. And some of them are perennial and others are new. And the way I like to do this is categorizing them in domains or buckets. For me, strategy, something I call TLC and the last being risk. So in the strategy bucket or domain, we're having constant conversations about growth and innovation, have to have it. But one that now is increasingly on the agenda is digitization. And TK, you've covered this in some of your shows as well. We've got to harness the power of the microchip to accelerate growth and innovation. The next domain or bucket is what I call TLC, talent, leadership, and culture. And frankly, TK, we could spend an entire episode or entire show just on that, if not uh, multiple episodes. And the last one is risk, of course, crisis management, incident preparation, um, what I call business continuity, uh, disaster recovery, cyber, ESG, third party risk, regulatory ethics, compliance. And here's one that's not new necessarily, it's just resurrecting one that we've kept dormant for the last maybe two so or so or more decades since the end of the Cold War, and that's geopolitics. Now, what's noteworthy, TK, is that the landscape, the context within which we deal with these GRC issues is changing. The erosion of the bright lines between the sectors in our society have, uh, well, it's been eroding between public, private, and civic or nonprofit sectors. And we're shifting to multiple constituency environments uh, where we now have more stakeholders than we had been dealing with before. But I will submit that we've always had those uh, stakeholders and and constituents. Only I think now the ESG movement is bringing that up to the fore. We're addressing multiple crises and issues simultaneously. We witnessed this firsthand over the last two years a health crisis, on top of an economic crisis, on top of a social crisis. And we still are living through some of that, although maybe in different forms, COVID-19 with its different variants, the economic crisis, which is essentially uh, fiscal and monetary policy inflation. And now on top of that, we're layering in geopolitics. We're seeing that on the six o'clock news every night. And now we're finding an increased imperative to establish and sustain because of all of this, increased trust and transparency in and out of the boardroom. You talked about a common thread. What I will offer to you in the audience is that I think the risk risk intensity is very high, especially when you factor in the interdependencies, the interconnections and intersections of all of these risks. And as I alluded to it, the risk environment that we're experiencing is evolving rapidly, requiring those of us in the boardroom to be even more disciplined, vigilant, resilient, agile, and flexible. You just reiterated why it's, you know, the bucket is full um, on this. And, um, you know, it it sort of lets me reflect back many years ago when you reminded me um, that all of this is in the context of strategy, okay? You can't talk about risk without talking about risk and strategy because, what you reminded me is that risk and strategy have to be looked at hand in hand. So knowing that and knowing how much boards need to oversee risk and oversee strategy, 
Talk to me about what questions the board should be asking management to be more effective with their GRC oversight. TK, thanks for framing it the way you did, because I, as you know, I've always felt that strategy and risk are two sides of the same coin, frankly. And to go further, in my view, a business strategy, which is designed to create and protect value, is only as good as the stress testing of the risks that are embedded in that strategy. Now, what's complicating the risk oversight management task and making it even more of an imperative is that we're all experiencing and living in an uber VUCA world where we're more exposed to unknown unknowns and extraordinary existential risks. And as many of your, uh, those of, uh, in the audience may already know about that acronym from the military, VUCA is the extreme volatility, uncertainty, complexity, some might call it chaos and confusion and ambiguity that's out there in the landscape. Now, as a board director and audit chair, I'm gonna borrow from my playbook in the military and the Pentagon and say that what I'm interested in, given that backdrop, is wanting to be sure that our company, my company, is organized, equipped and trained to handle all of this. More specifically, is our management organized, equipped and trained to address all of these risks and build enterprise resilience? Can the management team accurately identify, segment and rank and mitigate these risks? And then going a bit further, is our board also organized, equipped and trained to oversee these risks, the company's risks, and respond quickly. So as I think about those questions, TK, I'm going to be looking for the right hardware and software installed in the company. What do I mean by that? The people, processes, and tools that ought to be there in order to do just what those questions convey. So to starting with the right software, I'm referring to a robust risk infrastructure. And in that regard, I'm looking at at least two frameworks. There might be more, but these two are ones that I focus on quite a bit. It's the company's uh, three lines of defense framework or the three lines model as um, updated by the uh, IIA recently. And as you know, that first line is management or the risk owners, the operators. The second line, of course, are the risk staff officers, as I call them, the people that are responsible for risk control and compliance. And these typically are the chief risk officer, the CISO, the chief compliance officer, the um, data privacy officer, and the safety officer. Those are the individuals of the risk staff officers. And then the last one, which is my favorite, the internal audit function. These are the folks that assure, advise, and anticipate in order for us to protect, build, and preserve value. The second a framework that I'm interested in looking at and making sure that is uh, well established is an ERM system, Enterprise Risk Management System, that identifies, assesses, and manages the ex at least, at the very least, the existential risks. And so I'm looking for risk assessments and surveys to identify the inherent risks, ranking them by likelihood and impact. And then I want to focus on the quadrant, TK, that identifies the high consequence, low likelihood risks. And the reason for that is there, th those risks not only hurt the company, they can damage and destroy it. So I want to take that quadrant, those risks in that quadrant, and plot them according to the scope and certainty of the impact. And that top right-hand quadrant, when you do that, is that I refer to that top right-hand quadrant as the predictable surprises. And the reason for that is that although they're low probability, low likelihood, uh, they're, the, the consequence, they can happen, it could happen. It's possible that they can happen. And when they do, as the phrase goes, all hell could break loose. So I wanna take those risks then, once they're identified, and then go through some, what I call, pre-mortem crisis scenarios wargaming, uh, tabletops and simulations. 
And then taking all of that and, and all of that insight and assigning it to a responsible leader for mitigation. As a board member and then as an audit chair, I want to then conduct discipline and rigorous follow-up and updates to ensure that on an enterprise basis, there's healthy cross-functional engagement, coordination, collaboration, and alignment. I don't want to see siloitis or duplication or any kind of misalignment. Now, that's the, the what I call the right hardware. Let me pivot to the right software because in my view, the secret sauce, TK, is talent, leadership, culture. And here's how I unpack that. I'm looking for the right people with the right mix of skills and experiences, what I refer to as level five servant leaders and tri-sector leaders. And I can go in a little bit more detail a little later with the right attitude at the right time, because every company has its own cyclicality. And in the right environment, meaning a respectful and transparent culture, doing the right things, strategic issues and decisions in the right way, legally, morally, ethically. And what makes this all work, TK, fundamentally, in my view, given the experience I've had in all of these different sectors, in government, the military, and in the private sector, is that you have to have leaders of character, those who are humble and authentic, which Frankly, I think we're in short supply of. These kinds of leaders are the ones that are able to build and create and sustain mission first, people always, troops eat first, cultures and environments. Now, clearly I'm borrowing again from my military and Pentagon playbooks, but think about it. Those phrases, those taglines pack a lot of meaning. Mission first, people always, we're gonna get the job done and not but, and we're gonna take care of our people. Troop seat first, what that signifies is that we care more about the welfare of others than our own. So we're talking about building high trust environments, TK, where everyone is treated, respected, dignified and served as they would like to. So to sum up, if an organization has the right hardware and the right software, as I've described here, that then cascades and improves the company's risk posture. Wow, um, very well put. And uh, I, am, I am certainly gonna remember that troops eat first. I think that is a great uh, saying, and I'm, I'm gonna try and remember that. Um, uh, Michael, we have about 30 seconds left, but I wanted to ask you about one thing. And, you know, you had mentioned the pandemic and, you know, that was certainly a black swan type of event that's tough to identify. Um, social and racial unrest we had, you know, another black swan. Ukraine's a black swan. OK, and typically these are things that are difficult to plan for, but often disrupt a majority of our industries, okay? So I can only assume, and I'm asking you this, I'm assuming that flexibility in all of this is very important. TK, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Look, flexibility is a necessary imperative in the uber VUCA world that I was describing, where as you're pointing out, geopolitics, and economic and energy and national security are gonna be so much more prominent going forward. But flexibility is not sufficient by itself. You have to prepare, you have to practice for the next disruption. Prepare, practice, rinse and repeat. And the board meantime has to set the right tone as well. A lot of boards do this in terms of setting the tone at the top, which is great, but you gotta go further than that. Monitor the mood in the middle, be cognizant of the buzz at the bottom, because what I'm describing here is that it's an enterprise activity, a 360 activity. And then in terms of skill sets, all things being equal, I'm looking for tri-sector leaders who are fluent in cyber data privacy, compliance, all, all of the risks that I was mentioning before, but in particular now, regulatory, public policy, and geopolitics, TK. Look, a little PSA for our audience. This world is a tough and we're seeing sometimes can be a very nasty place. 
And this is a world because of that, I think, where geopolitics rule. You get that wrong, and I believe the rest doesn't matter. Our ability as a democracy to influence the the behavior of others, particularly adversaries, on issues like human rights and climate change and other matters that we care deeply about depends on our geopolitical power. Some commentators have already said that we're in Cold War 2.0 and real politic is, is back so that we're going to be experiencing strategic, political, social, economic, energy, and environmental turbulence for the foreseeable future. So in my view, because of that, I think the boredom of the future is going to have more directors with tri-sector backgrounds, individuals that know firsthand what it's like to be in a business, firsthand to be in government and or the military, at firsthand to be in a nonprofit, and also directors that have backgrounds in national security and geopolitics. Well, Michael, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Um, you always um, have a great plan for laying things out and in turn it creates for a great uh, show for our audience. So thank you for taking the time to join me. My pleasure, TK. Thank you for the opportunity. And that will conclude this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. <music>